It probably doesn't surprise you that predation can be a strong selective force for traits that reduce a prey's risk of death. If a prey cannot defend itself, it will die, and thus natural selection has favored individuals that are more difficult to find, capture, subdue, and consume. Predation involves four steps, search, recognition, capture, and handling. And the possibility of coevolution of predator and prey operates at each one of these steps. First, the predator must search the environment for an acceptable prey. Next, the predator needs to determine if a potential prey that it has located is acceptable to consume, and if so, physically apprehend this prey. Finally, the predator needs to handle or possibly process the prey in order to finalize the consumption. Prey have developed a wide variety of adaptations to limit their predator's success at each one of these steps, and as such, predators have also developed counter-adaptations to their prey's defense. Among the most spectacular examples of these anti-predator defenses are found among the animals that are able to avoid detection in the first place by remaining nearly invisible against their background, a defense that we refer to as crypsis. Cryptic adaptations can be found in a huge variety of animal groups and the ecosystems that they inhabit. Color and texture that mimic the background surface can be incredibly successful defenses against predators that hunt via visual cues. For example, this individual has done a fabulous job matching both the color and texture of this tree. Can you find it? Try your hand at these. And of course, predators can benefit from blending in as well. Well, what can we do once a potential prey is detected? Some species try to avoid being eaten by producing poisons or toxins to defend themselves. However, it wouldn't do much good if the predator didn't find out that the prey was poisonous until after it ate them. In an attempt to make it very clear that they are not a prey that the predator would want to eat, Species that contain powerful toxins are often brightly colored, using what we refer to as aposomatic coloration. Predators instinctually avoid or learn over time to avoid these prey. Tree frogs and coral snakes are some of the most well-known animals that provide these warning signals. And this stinging rose caterpillar even throws in some spikes in case the bright color wasn't warning enough. While the production of toxin can be very effective, it is also costly. Some species have adapted over time to cheat the system by mimicking toxic species, even if they themselves are not actually toxic. Batesian mimicry is characterized by the adoption of appearance or behavior associated with an unpalatable or threatening species as a means of protection. The coral and king snake mimicry is probably one of the best known examples. Coral snakes are highly poisonous and are thought to have the second strongest venom of any snake. The scarlet king snake, on the other hand, is a non-venomous snake that closely mimics the tri-banded pattern of the coral snake. Mimics don't have to be closely related. This picture on the right is a green parrot snake, and even though it's not venomous, many animals choose to avoid eating snakes in general. However, this picture on the left is not a snake at all, but a caterpillar, the larva of a hawk moth. When hawk moths sense a predator, such as a bird, they will inflate their body to take on the appearance of a snake. What makes this system even more interesting is that the parrot snake itself is a mimic. When threatened, the green parrot snake will stand its ground, raise its head off the ground, and face the threat with a gaping, hissing mouth. If the threat persists, it will flatten its neck and hiss louder, and then open its mouth once more. This behavior may lead some predators to mistake the parrot snake for a species of viper. Many studies have confirmed the effectiveness of mimicry and connected it to how predators learn avoidance. Monarch butterflies contain chemicals known as cardiac glycosides in their bodies, which the caterpillars sequester from milkweed plants that they feed on. This makes them not only foul tasting, but these chemicals can produce heart-arresting effects on anything that consumes them. 
the pipeline swallowtail also obtains their toxin from the plant that they feed on. Both of these butterflies have species that appear to mimic their coloration and pattern. In a classic evolutionary study, Austin Pratt and colleagues used these two butterflies to see if exposure to the toxic species would lead blue jays to avoid species that mimic them. The research team took 131 blue jays and assigned them to one of three groups. Over the course of 10 conditioning trials, individuals in the first group of birds were given a choice between a tiger swallowtail, an edible species, and a monarch, a toxic species. Both the second and third groups were presented with a tiger swallowtail, the edible, and a pipe vine swallowtail, also a toxic species. Most birds learned to reject the unpalatable model by the end of the conditioning period. Choice experiments followed the conditioning trials. Group 1 birds were simultaneously given a choice of either a viceroy butterfly, which mimics the monarch, or a red-spotted purple butterfly, which was not a mimic of any species that the birds encountered in the conditioning trials. However, this species is a mimic of the pipe vine. Group 2 was presented with the exact same options, but in this case the red-spotted purple was classified as the mimic because these birds encountered the pipe vine in their conditioning trials. The researchers then monitored the number of bird attacks on each species of butterfly, and I'm guessing you have a pretty good idea of what the results showed. In group one, the viceroy did not get a single attack from any of the birds. However, 88% of the birds attacked the red-spotted purple butterfly. Note that these don't add up to 100% because no, not all of the birds attacked. Group two showed the exact opposite trend, with the viceroy recruiting more than twice as many attacks as the red-spotted purple. So in both groups, the birds tended to avoid the mimics of the toxic species that they had previously been exposed to. So what about group three? These birds were also given the red spotted purple as a choice, but the second choice was what was thought at the time to be a closely related species, the banded purple butterfly. Although they look similar, more birds chose to attack the species that looked least like the pipe vine. Now here's what I think is one of the most interesting parts of this study. Even though this wasn't discovered until many years later, the banded purple butterfly and the red spotted purple butterfly are actually the same species. They're just different morphs. And the morph with the white band is only found in regions where there are no pipe vine swallowtails. In other words, in regions where there were no pipe vine swallowtails, there was no selective advantage for the evolution of the red spotted morph. Before moving on, I don't want to neglect the adaptations that plants have developed to fend off herbivores, adaptations that allow the plant to either avoid the herbivore, tolerate the herbivore's damage, or defend itself against the threat. One way to avoid seed-eating herbivores is a process known as masting, which occurs when plants produce a very large number of seeds during some years, and few or no seeds at years in between. By overwhelming consumers with seeds, there is a greater chance that one will survive. Blue oaks are a classic masting species, producing a highly variable seed crop from one year to the next that is synchronized among individuals over a wide area. In a mast year, a mature blue oak may produce more than 100,000 acorns, more than 10 times the annual average, and is likely to produce few or no acorns in a poor year. Some plants that tolerate herbivory do so via compensatory growth, which is the production of new plant tissue that has been stimulated by herbivory. For example, gentians are alpine flowers that respond to herbivory or clipping by producing more branches and more flowers. This allows it to compensate for current and possibly future attack. And finally, plants use an enormous array of structural and chemical defenses to discourage herbivores, such as the spines on acacia trees or the toxins produced by geraniums to ward off Japanese beetles. Within 30 minutes of ingestion, the chemical paralyzes the herbivore. While the chemical usually wears off within a few hours, during this time, the beetle is often consumed by its own predators.